double feature starring Jackie Gleason with Les Tremaine, Andy Russell, Toots Camerata and his orchestra, Miss Patsy Garrett. Now here's the big boy himself, Jackie Gleason. Thank you. Thank you. Figaro. Figaro. Figaro, 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 Figaro. Hey, Figaro, your mother wants you. Where's the large you, Jubes? Uh, Jackie, what do you think you're doing? Tremaine, you are now looking at the great Gleason of the Baby Grand Opera Company. You mean the Grand Opera Company? No, Baby Grand. This is a small company. (laughs) Ah, you should have heard me the other night singing outside the Metropolitan. Why didn't you sing on the inside? That's where I started. (laughs) I was singing pear-shaped tones, and somebody hit me in the mouth with a banana. (laughs) Well, don't let that worry you, Jackie. Why don't you sing something now, just for me? Uh, Do you really want me to sing something, Les? No, but I'd like a banana. I, uh, I don't think you realize that I happen to come from one of the most musical families in the world. My mother did a solo at the opera, my sister did a solo, and my, uh, brother did a solo. What about your father? Did he do a solo? Well, where he was, they called it solitary. <laughs> well, Jackie, that's a musical heritage of which you may be proud. And who hath more reason to be proud? Who hath? Hath anyone? Don't ask me. I pass. <laughs> you know something, Les? Uh, Les... I'd, I'd like to sing something really fine for you. Just listen to this. Isn't that wonderful? Wonderful? What was that? That, my friend, was the end of the unfinished symphony. Figaro. Figaro, Figaro, Figaro. Hey, what's going on here? Oh, hello, Andy. I was just loosening up. Oh, excuse me. I thought you were falling apart. <laughs> Andy, my boy, there was a wise man who said that we learned something new every day. And today we learn that Jackie Gleason is an opera singer. An opera singer? Do you sing pretty? I sure do, beautiful. <laughs> ah, you should hear me go into an obligato. Out of an obligato into a cadenza. Out of a cadenza into a staccato. And out of a staccato into an oxygen tent. <laughs> Jackie, uh, I, I don't mean to be rude, but I, I don't think you know anything about singing. Oh. Singing is a very complicated art. You have to know exactly where your voice comes from. Why, I know all about my voice. This morning I started it in the abdomen. Then I forced it up to the diaphragm. From the diaphragm, I pushed it up through the alimentary canal to the larynx. From the larynx, I shoved it up through the epiglottis. And from the epiglottis, I heaved it up to the cranium. Then I dragged it back down to the oral cavity and shot it out between my teeth. Yeah. What happened to it after that? The last I heard of it, it was going through Pittsburgh like a mink. <laughs> If you really want to know how a voice should travel from the diaphragm to the epiglottis, listen to Andy Russell as he sings Sunny Side of the Street. Get your coat and get your hat. Leave your worries on the doorstep. Just direct your feet to the sunny side of the street. Can't you hear a bitter pet and that happy tune is your step? Life can be so sweet. On the sunny side of the street I used to walk in the shade Where those blues I'm afraid Oh, but I'm not afraid This rover crossed over If I never have a cent I'll be rich as Rockefeller Gold dust at my feet On the sunny side of the street Jackie, Andy is a real singer. You notice the response he gets when he sings? 
See how the girls swoon? Means absolutely nothing. I do the same thing. You mean the girls swoon when you sing? Are you kidding? Stand back a few paces. I'll stand back. Arpeggio, please. They can't Closing passage. Yes, but your middle section, entirely too bravura for fondo. That happens to be the way this suit fits. <laughs> no, 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 Jackie. Every musician should be familiar with musical terms. Now, for instance, what do you know about rubato, glissando, misere, grosso? Huh, only the best backfield Notre Dame ever had. <laughs> no, no, you don't understand. Misere means miserable, and grosso means big and fat. <laughs> I was out with the misere grosso last night. <laughs> Jackie, I give up. You not only don't know how to sing, but you don't know anything about music. That is ridiculous. Why, I've even written music. Great music. At the age of nine, I began to write symphonies, operas, and concertos. Really? I'd like to hear some of your decompositions. We have... You mean compositions. Decomposition is something rotten. <laughs> you can't discourage me, Tremaine. I'm going ahead as a composer. You don't know how I've worked and struggled... Every morning since I was six years old, I've gotten up, gone downstairs, sat on the piano stool, and practiced for five hours. I practiced hour after hour, day after day, year after year, sitting on the piano stool, practicing, practicing, practicing. Then one day, after 15 years, came my first big disappointment. What was that? I found out we didn't have a piano. <laughs> uh, Jackie, you do not have the true spirit of a composer. A composer must hear the music of the spheres. You must hear it from the heart. You must hear it from the soul. You must hear it from the brain. What do you hear from the brow? <laughs> hey, Jackie, the Metropolitan Opera Company just phoned. They expect you tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock. Thank you, Patsy. Thank you. That's the call I've been waiting for. Tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock, I am going to audition my new opera entitled La Bella Dory, a Picadora. Or oh, don't chop any more wood tonight, Mother. I'm coming home with a load. <laughs> Jackie, you don't mean you've written a grand opera. Gee, I didn't think you could do that, Jackie. You didn't think I could write an opera? I didn't think you could write. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you're going to audition this opera in style, Jackie. You know, you should get somebody to sing the aria. Oh, well, gosh, I can help you. Then listen to what I can do. Hmm. A little worm, saw another little worm, saw in the field one day. He fell in love with the other little worm, and his heart was light and gay. You're beautiful, he told the little worm. I'd like to be your friend. Don't be a ghost, the other worm replied, because I'm your other end. <laughs> well, don't you like my voice, Jackie? Your pizzicato is too legato, and your vibrato is much too staccato for such a young tomato. <laughs> Well, you just don't appreciate good singing. Why, my voice sets men's hearts ticking. It awakens them. It has a ring in it. Well, wind it up and set it for 8 o'clock. <laughs> now, uh, the next thing we ought to find is a leading man. Yes, that's right. Now, where can we find a handsome, romantic young singer? Hello, Mr. Gleason. How are you, Andy? The man who plays the part must have dark hair and eyes and a beautiful lyric voice. Hello, Mr. Gleason. How are you, Andy? He must have dash. He must have dash and charm. He must be the great lover type. Hello, Mr. Gleason. How are you, Andrew? He must have... Why, Andy, you're just the man I'm looking for. Do you mean it, Mr. Gleason? Yes. Will you run down to the corner and get me a bag of pistachio nuts? <laughs> <laughs> Jackie, Andy's the very man to sing the romantic lead. Uh, do you know anything about opera, Andy? Sure, Jackie. Opera runs in my family. My brother's at home right now singing a duet from Faust. Who with? Me. We. 
Well, what are you doing here? Oh, I finished first. He finished first. <laughs> Jackie, before you go ahead with this opera business, let me warn you that composers lead lives of great poverty. I know all about that. But look at the rewards they got. Take the life of Johann Sebastian Grudnick. I wonder what his name was before he changed it. <laughs> he was a poor composer with 11 children. One day he took his 11 children for a parade. And when he returned, he counted his children, and there were 12. So he took aside the 12th child, sat down at the piano, and composed his first musical masterpiece to this little gurgling fellow in swaddling clothes. What was it? Is you is or is you ain't my baby. <laughs>
come to Papa, come to Papa, do. My sweet embrace to Of your opera. It's about a king who is receiving a committee. The first committeeman steps forth, sings, and dies. The second man steps forth, sings, and dies. The third man steps forth, sings, and dies. But operas don't have plots like that. Now take your favorite opera, for instance. Hey, what is your favorite opera? Well, the one I like best is The Barber of Seville, the way it's sung by my uncle Fortissimo Gleason, otherwise known as Lawrence Forbits. He sings twice as loud as Lawrence Tibbetts. <laughs> How do you like Rigoletto and Traviata? With meatballs and plenty of sauce. <laughs> now, let's take the plot of Puccini's great opera, Tosca. Throughout the opera, the leading tenor, Cavaradossi, is chased by the police. He sings that bad, huh? <laughs> and then, in the final scene, the hero's sweetheart stands the chief of police and places a lighted candle at his feet. Wow. Oh, it isn't enough. She stabs him. She's got to give him a hot foot. <laughs> I remember the night I heard Caruso sing Tusker. He had a magnificent voice. Uh, you should have heard my uncle. He was such a great singer that two years after he lost his voice, he was still singing Pagliacci in sign language. Is he still singing? No, he broke his finger hitting a high C and we had to shoot him. <laughs> Jackie, Jackie, why don't you spare yourself some grief? Stay away from opera. You're more the jukebox type. You see... Jukebox? Never. Never mention jukebox to me. Why not? Sit down, and I'll tell you. It was in a cocktail lounge of Park Avenue's most fashionable restaurant that I first fell in love. There she was, standing in the corner. The lights were on. Her discs were revolving. I looked at her, and she turned green. Purple, yellow, all the colors of the rainbow dashed through her neon veins. I had never seen such a beautiful jukebox. She was dynamic, electric, orthophonic. Entranced, I walked over, put a nickel in her, and she played the song that was to become our song. Bessie May Mucho. It was the beginning of a tragic romance. Night after night, it was just Juki and I and Bessie May Mucho. Bessie May Mucho! Bessie May Mucho! I just couldn't get enough of her Bessie May Mucho. <laughs> that first blissful week cost me ten years of my life, all my self-respect, and $4.80 in nickels. I knew she only loved me for my money. I knew she would play with me for a while and then cast me aside like an old shoe-shoe baby. But I was a lost soul. I couldn't resist it. Embarrassed, I would sneak over to the cashier and say, a dollar's worth of nickels, please. My friends were beginning to avoid me. They would look at me strangely and say, Look out, here comes Gleason now. He'll probably want some change. Whenever I was away from Juki, I'd remember all the lovely things she said to me the night before. Amor, amor. Bessie me mucho. Or would you rather be a pig? <laughs> and that tender, that tender mad night. When she had the hiccups and kept singing, it had to be you, it had to be you, it had to be you, it had to be you. <laughs> then one night I walked in and there she was with another man. He said he was the repairman. Repairman, ha, ha, ha. 
There he was, standing close to her, a glass in one hand and a can in the other. They both were getting oiled. <laughs> After that, she was never quite the same, Todd. We began to have little arguments. She'd talk back to me. I'd push number three, and she'd play number four. <laughs> At first, all she wanted was nickels. But now she wanted dimes and quarters, too. I was running out of cash. One night with my last nickel, I, I asked her to play Bessie May Mocho. She lit up and yelled, get out of here and get me some money soon. She was giving me the needle. <laughs> then, then one awful night it happened. I noticed that gay, vivacious Juki was slipping. Her neons were sagging. She was, get, she was getting careless about changing her records. And she was slowing down. Yes, she was slowing down. As I turned to say goodnight, she said, I'll be seeing you. <laughs> I looked at her. I looked at her horrified. With my heart pounding, I realized what this meant. She was tilted. <laughs> Hurriedly, I phoned for the doctor. He came immediately. He shook his head and said, we'll have to operate at once. She has four slugs in her. <laughs> then he took her away. The next night, I went back to the place. Our place. And there, instead of Juki, standing in her corner, I saw a loud, flashy, painted hussy. A bleached blonde with a curly maple top. She winked at me with a magic eye, and guiltily, I slipped her a nickel. I don't know why I did it. I was so ashamed. Juki in the hospital and me playing around with another machine. So I went home and I waited for Juki's return. But she never came back. She left the hospital and disappeared. I searched for her in candy stores, bingo parlors, pool rooms, delicatessens. Then one day I heard she was working in McGillicuddy Saloon. She had a new steel arm and a new set of waxes. I rushed down to find her. I walked in and my heart stood still. There was a big crowd around her. I realized immediately something was wrong. I pushed my way through the crowd and said, give her air. There she was on the barroom floor, an old slot. How? How she had changed. There were circles under her eyes where people had set down wet glasses. All the color was gone on one side, and she had blown a fuse. I picked her up in my arms. I put a nickel in her, but nothing happened. I shook her. Speak to me, I cried. Speak to me. Her lights had gone out. She was just an empty shell. She had no motor to guide her. I knew. I knew that that this was the end. I put my arms around it. Tears were running down my face. The only jukebox in the world that could ever mean anything to me was dying in my arms. And without a nickel. But before she died, I held her close and whispered, Goodbye, Juki. She smiled tenderly and replied, Goodbye, Juki. <laughs> song and a fine singer. Andy Russell brings us his version of Don't Blame Me. Don't blame me for falling in love with you. I'm under your spell, but how can I help it? Don't blame me. Blame on 
all your charms that melt the land that don't blame me. I can't help it if that dog on moon above makes me need someone like you.